Uh, thanks for the introduction and to all of you for uh, coming. Uh, I flew in from New England last night, uh, where we've had the worst winter since the Middle Ages. So uh, it's nice to know uh, spring exists. Um, also yesterday, I pressed the key um, uh, on the book that Roger mentioned uh, on John Brown that I've been working on for three years. So I'm feeling rather uh, wonderfully unburdened uh, today to wake up and not have to uh, stare at my own uh, difficult prose. Um, this book was a, a little bit of a departure for me, as some of you know from chatting with you in the uh, foyer. My previous books uh, tend to mix uh, history with journalism and travel. Uh, this book, Midnight Rising, stays uh, firmly moored in the past. Um, there's no me in it. Um, uh, there's no antics. Uh, there's no reenacting. Um, uh, and this this was um, always an easy uh, transition for me. Uh, I was in Harper's Ferry on my way to the wonderful uh, Park Service archives there, and someone told me that there was a John Brown beard growing contest in progress <laughs> up the street. I, I have no idea what that means. Uh, I mean, a bunch of guys sitting around drinking beer and watching their beards grow. Uh, and in my old incarnation, I would have run right for it, but this time didn't, didn't look right or left, went straight to the library. Um, so I thought I'd uh, take a, a little different tack today. And um, you know, doing this book, I guess a more traditional book, has, has made me think about different approaches to history and sort of what I've been doing before and what I'm doing now. So I thought I'd give a little talk that's more about method than uh, content. Um, but I'm happy to talk about John Brown in question and answer since I've been living and breathing him for three years and have bored my family to tears. So I'm glad to have anyone to talk to about it. Um, the bit of reading that gave me the idea for this talk uh, was an essay by uh, the Princeton historian Sean Willens called America Made Easy. And in it he wrote, we are living in a new golden age of historical popularization. Academic historians have lost contact with the large reading public, and into the breach has stepped an assortment of journalists, novelists, and PBS filmmakers. Willens refers to these interlopers as, quote, journalist semi-pro historians. Um, that's an ungainly job title and not altogether flattering, uh, but I think it fits, um, for me at least. Um, so these are a few of the questions I thought I'd pose today. How does a reporter by training write about history? How does that differ from the methods of academic historians? And what are the pluses and pitfalls of this journalist semi-pro approach? Um, just first for context, just so you know how I uh, sort of stumbled into this line of work. Um, I was a uh, history nerd from early childhood and a history major in college and thought I wanted to uh, spend my life at some uh, bucolic campus, uh, you know, burrowing into the past. Uh, but my thesis advisor in college uh, knew me better than I knew myself, or uh, perhaps he was just being kind about my job prospects. Uh, but after reading my thesis, he uh, suggested I set aside plans for graduate school. <laughs> And as he put it, uh, get out in the world for a while, um, which I did more than really I ever imagined or planned. I became a journalist, um, married an Australian, also a reporter, who uh, promptly dragged me overseas, where we spent more than a decade uh, really trolling the globe, uh, mostly covering wars and conflicts. Uh, so that by my mid-30s, I was a sort of nomadic foreign correspondent with a shortwave radio and a Kevlar vest always at the ready, uh, essentially the opposite of the archive-dwelling scholar I'd always dreamed of becoming. Um, and whenever I tried to sneak a, more than a paragraph of history into my news stories, uh, the copy desk would invariably cut it out. Um, you know, they don't call it the news business for nothing. Um, you know, I wanted a way back to studying the past, but I really uh, didn't know how to do anything other than catch planes uh, to strange places and improvise once I got there. And then gradually it occurred to me that I could apply this MO to history uh, by going to the places where history happened and reporting on what I found and the memory keepers I met. Uh, I became, in essence, uh, a reporter on the history beat. 
And this led uh, to uh, a book, Confederates in the Attic, which I gather a few of you have read. And you know I went to rebel flag rallies and meetings of the sons, daughters, and children of the Confederacy and dawn vigils to battlefields and other venues to grasp uh, why memory of the war is so enduring. Uh, I also took a cue from George Plimpton, uh, the great practitioner of participatory journalism. Uh, for those of you too young to remember him, uh, he wrote about boxing by going a few rounds with a professional heavyweight and about football by briefly playing quarterback for the Detroit Lions. He ran five plays, fumbled twice, and lost 30 yards. Um, in my own case, I engaged in participatory history by joining a band of hardcore Civil War reenactors. Um, who seek purity and absolute fidelity to the past uh, by sewing their own uniforms so that it has precisely the same thread count uh, as uniforms had in the 1860s, uh, by eating only the foods that Civil War soldiers would have eaten, such as hardtack and salt pork, or really eating almost nothing at all so they can starve themselves into the gaunt, hollow-eyed confederates of uh, Civil War tintypes. And they really don't like reenacting combat because, after all, how realistic can it be when there's no uh, live ammunition or actual bloodshed? Now, it's easy to spend time uh, with these folks and uh, conclude just plain nuts. Um, and many of them are, with apologies to any hardcores in the audience. Uh, they think that by getting the props just right, uh, they can somehow almost breathe the same molecules as their ancestors. Uh, and travel through time, experiencing a, a drug-like high that they call a period rush. Um, Reenactors also tend to sanitize and simplify the past, turning war into pure spectacle. Their mantra is honoring the heroism and sacrifice of soldiers both north and south, rather than debating the causes and passions that underlay the conflict. Uh, it's because of all that that uh, professional historians tend to regard reenactors as annoying amateurs. Um, but after weeks of hanging around campfires and bloating on mock battlefields, I came to see value in play-acting history. No matter how much you read about uh, the misery of long marches in Virginia heat or the tedium of camp life, you'll appreciate it a lot better after trudging for 10 miles in heavy wool and ill-fitting boots or spooning all night with rank Confederates and eating salt pork cooked on bayonets over a sodden fire. Reenacting also helped me grasp how everyday Americans experience history. Uh, Reenacting isn't a fringe hobby, or it certainly wasn't at the time uh, I was researching that book. Uh, it's one of the main vehicles of Civil War remembrance, uh, really attracting tens of thousands of participants and spectators, including many women and children. And most of the reenactors I spoke to have a reverence for the past and what I'd call really almost a, a low-grade discontent with modern life. Reenacting offers them vicarious contact with an era that seems somehow more heroic, a time when roles and causes were clear cut and individuals could make a difference. I did a, a very different form of reenacting for my next book, Blue Latitudes, about the Pacific voyages of Captain James Cook. I signed on as a volunteer sailor aboard a museum quality replica of Cook's first ship, the Endeavor, which sails around the world in the explorer's wake. Now, most of my fellow mar mariners were, um, frankly, uh, deranged folk who had read too many Patrick O'Brien novels <laughs> and thought there was something, you know, romantic about sailing a tall ship. Uh, I didn't have those illusions. Um, I felt that if I was going to understand Cook's travels, I had to understand how he traveled and what it was like to be a sailor in the 18th century Navy. Um, and now I know it, it sucked. Uh, <laughs> The Endeavor was basically a wobbly wooden tub with absolutely no concession to comfort or aesthetics. Uh, we slept below decks in narrow hammocks with 14 inches of airspace uh, each. That was the uh, British uh, Navy's notion of personal space in the 18th century. And in their day, the toilets were uh, planks of wood over the front of the bow called seats of ease. Uh, we spent much of our workday aloft at or near the top of a 127-foot mast. Uh, which is roughly the height of a 10-story building. Um, and as I quickly learned, height radically amplifies the motion of a ship at sea. Uh, so if you're in heavy weather and the deck is going like this, when you're up at the top of that mast, it's going like this. And also like this as the uh, uh, ship pitches into waves, creating this really uh, hideous corkscrew effect. 
And meanwhile, you have to work, hard work, uh, furling and unfurling sails, sort of uh, untying knots upside down as you lean over the topmost yard while you're trying not to uh, hurl into the sea far below. <laughs> Um, for someone who uh, doesn't particularly like heights um, and is prone to seasickness, uh, this was not a pleasant experience. Um, but my time on the Endeavor taught me as much about the wooden world of 18th century sailing as the many books I'd read on the subject. I think one of the, uh, the biggest challenges of writing about history is recovering the strangeness of the past, what it felt like to be there, and how it was different from our own time. And one of those differences struck me immediately on the Endeavor. Today, work is all about saving time and labor, and also many of us spend our work days alone at a computer terminal. On 18th century ships, they had plenty of time and plenty of labor, and almost all of it was collective. Each task took forever by our standards and required backbreaking physical exertion by group brute force. I was also struck by the crowding and utter lack of privacy. Uh, which gave me some sense of how claustrophobic it must have been for a hundred men, along with livestock, to be crammed on this hundred-foot wooden ship for three years. This helped me appreciate the way, men's, the way Cook's men behaved, both their drunken brawling and violence at sea, and their eagerness on land to escape the strictures of Navy life for the libertine ways of Polynesian society. Now, I, I don't mean to suggest that uh, my time on the Endeavor or as a hardcore reenactor uh, was in any way comparable to what English sailors or Civil War soldiers endured. And I think that's a, a mistake uh, reenactors too often make. Uh, they'll often say to you, you know, I was there, as if they'd really been back to the Civil War. Uh, well, they weren't there by a long shot. Um, also, many of them, you know, don't even like being called reenactors. They prefer the term. Uh, living historians, um, as if by definition all other historians are dead, uh, <laughs> writing you know, dry monographs for each other while living historians are out there uh, doing the, the real work of sharing history with the public. Um, so